So welcome to everyone again. We do have some folks who are continuing to join us. My name is Jamie Smith. I'm the Director of Social Innovation with the Cody Institute and Extension Department at St. Francis Xavier University. And we're very pleased to be here today in partnership with the Cody Inst International Institute and the Center for Employment Innovation at CENEVEX to host our third in a series of kitchen table conversations on the future of work and workers. And today we will be exploring the impact of technology on the nonprofit sector. And so uh, we do have a few folks here today, Yogesh Gore and Brian Lazuri, Kate Thompson and myself, who are calling in from Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people in Nova Scotia, Canada on Turtle Island. And we are very pleased today to be joined uh, with our three panelists, Jillian Baker, and uh, Jillian is the Monitoring and Impact Measurement Specialist with the Mennonite Economic Development Associates. We're also very pleased to have with us from India this morning, Prabhat Lab, the Chief Executive Officer of the Grameen Foundation, as well as Dr. Latte Lawson Lartego, who is the Director of Inclusive and Resilient Food Systems with Oxfam. Now I will pass it along to Yogesh Gore and Farooq Jiwa, with the Cody Institute to lead our conversation this morning. Thank you and we'll look forward to hearing from our panelists and our conversation as well as folks here in the chat room as well. Thank you, Jamie, as always. Uh, so wonderful to see everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. I see so many folks uh, joining from different parts of the world. I see so many Cody graduates as well uh, who are uh, sending us uh, messages uh, uh, on the side. So nice to, to have you all and, and see the, the level of uh, engagement uh, in this webinar. Uh, before we uh, begin uh, the topic for today, uh, let me just give you a little bit of uh, uh, context uh, to the Kitchen Table uh, webinar series and, and why we are calling it uh, uh, Kitchen Table uh, webinar. You know, um, we are all in this, this, in, in this pandemic now and um, we have been uh, given a reference uh, when we describe this global crisis as that this is uh, the worst crisis since the World War uh, II. Or, or we have all, uh, often been told that the, the recessions that, uh, that we are going to see now uh, will, will be similar or worse than the Great Depression. So if, if we uh, look back those, those events in, in the global history, be it World War II or, or, or a Great <coughs> Depression, um, and if we go back then, uh, there was uh, another uh, revolution happening that was in this part of uh, uh, Canada. And just like US and other parts of the world, uh, this part of uh, Canada, Atlantic Canada, was also uh, going through a lot of uh, challenges uh, during that period of the 20s and the, and the 30s. And this university <clears throat> um, uh, back then um, uh, had uh, a priest named Moses Cody and also another one, uh, Jimmy Tompkins. And they were uh, at the university, and and uh, and normally the university is is a place where uh, you come to get education. You you learn. Back then, because these uh, the uh, the, com the surrounding communities were facing so many challenges, the university, uh, particularly Moses Cody and Jimmy Tompkins, they wanted to flip that idea of people coming to the university. Instead of that, the university went to people. Uh, uh, instead of that being a place where to come to learn, how about learning goes to community? So what happened was uh, back then in the 20s and the 30s, <clears throat> uh, Father Cody and, and, and colleagues started to go out to the communities and started engaging with people, talking uh, to them after they are back from their work in, in sort of very accessible and less in intimidating way where people can, can circle uh, around a kitchen table and talk about not only problems, but how they can come out of those problems. And those social interactions around the kitchen table led to uh, a movement, uh, building of a massive social capital that led to uh, the creation of producer cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, credit union, which provided people access to, to credit and access to services that saw a uh, mass movement of cooperative uh, development in this part of the world. And, and the same learning <coughs> of, of, of with people saw uh, the, the same learning uh, was applied in Canada and elsewhere. 
so at the Cody Institute, uh, we took those those learning and and we took it to the uh, to the world. But how it started was through these kitchen table dialogues where. Uh, experts went into into the community and and started talking to people and and co-created uh, innovation and, and and solution so that was the idea uh, behind starting these these series of uh, dialogues uh, this kitchen table dialogues where we talk about important issues of today uh, uh, but in a way that is engaging that is more accessible and and and, and very human in terms of interaction so we have um, had three of uh, these uh, conversations uh, and and we are uh, doing it around the, the the theme of future of work and workers our uh, and and so far uh, we started uh, in a small way but uh, we had a, a very good sort of level of engagement we have over 600 people shown interest and participated in these webinars the first one uh, we had was on on the impact of covid on workers the second one was on the role of social enterprises and nonprofits uh, in, in ensuring uh, equity uh, inclusion uh, in the economy. And one sort of uh, theme that has been consistent as we are having this dialogue is that technology is a key, a key driver for future of work and future of workers. And in that context, uh, we wanted to sort of have this uh, third uh, webinar. Uh, and particularly, we, uh, we hear a lot in terms of how technology is going to impact jobs in the private sector, how it is going to impact uh, the access to services, but not a lot uh, we hear on the, the impact of technology on the nonprofit sector. So that's what we thought we will do in this, this, this particular webinar. So with that, I would like uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Farooq Jiva. Uh, Farooq and I go, go a long way back. He's a co-facilitator here. Uh, him and I actually are going to start a new course on future of work and workers starting next week, but we have taught many courses together. He's a social entrepreneur uh, and, and he's worked in, in many international uh, settings. Uh, so with that little introduction, Farooq, over to you. Well, thank you, Yogesh, and uh, hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to see all the names show up in the chat box, some, some old names and some new names as well. So, so um, welcome. We're really looking forward to the discussion that we have ahead. Um, to, to pick up from where Yogesh has sort of left things and to frame the conversation a little bit more, Yogesh had mentioned that, you know, as we've been doing the research for this upcoming course on the future of work and workers, which the Center for Employment Innovation and the Cody Institute are going to be um, organizing later this, uh, this month, we found a lot of information about what is going to be happening in the for-profit sector as these different technologies begin to become uh, more, more, uh, um, more apparent, more obvious in, in, in our daily lives. What we haven't found as much is what is happening in terms of the technology and landscape in the not-for-profit sector. And the objective of today's discussion is really to delve into that a little bit more. And we've sort of chosen three big sort of buckets to have a discussion around. The first one is the question of data. Um, as many of you know, for artificial intelligence, for machine learning, for deep learning, which is one big technology pillar that we're seeing more and more in our lives every day, Data is a really, really important driver. And when you think about a lot of not-for-profit organizations, the kind of projects that we're involved in internationally, uh, we collect all types of data. But a lot of the times the data is driven towards meeting the needs of a specific project or a specific donor. And we're not thinking about this in terms of um, actionable intelligence that we can use to improve our programming uh, and to think things through a little bit further. And there is also the question regarding the, uh, the privacy of data and, and the, the privacy of the communities that we work with. So we want to unpack this a little bit more and we can't think of better people than Jillian, Latte and Prabhas to help us uh, in, in, this, in this exploration. The second one we wanted to think about as well is, you know, as we, as we look at this, the, the future workplace and as technology begins to displace lots of people, whether it's, uh, you know, a radiologist going to be re replaced by deep learning that can spot um, cancer cells in a lung just as well as they can, or an accountant being displaced by, 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 um, by technology, we were thinking to ourselves, what, what does a 21st century development worker look like? Within the context of all of these emerging technologies, does the role of a development professional in the 21st century begin to change? And then finally, we wanted to take a step back and within this, his, in this moment in history, think about the question of what exactly is the future of the not-for-profit sector? 
as we begin to ask the question about the future of the workplace, um, with all of the pressure that's coming on, the amount of debt that the various countries that have been donors to uh, um, international development work are under pressure, a lot of private uh, donors whose personal investments have also been affected. We are expecting to see a bit of a dip in funding over the next little while. So we thought, well, rather than us academics sitting back and pontificating about this, let's ask the, the people who work in the field these questions and see what they have to say. So with that, if I may invite Prabhat Lab to talk for a few minutes, tell us a little bit about yourself, tell us a little bit about the organization you represent, and then pick the thread from any one of those questions and uh, help us to begin the conversation. Prabhat? Thanks, Yogesh, uh, and uh, thanks, Farooq and, and Yogesh. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, introduction, uh, and of course, delighted to be part of this, this kitchen table uh, conversation. So we today stand at a very, uh, very, very interesting point in, in the history. You know, uh, of course, all of us, you know, these days like to start any conversation with saying, you know, in this times of COVID or in the post-COVID world. But actually, I would like to go back, you know, even before the COVID started, and we were looking at you know, the, the progress of various countries on say SDGs, uh, you know, uh, SDG goals for 2030. And it was obvious that many countries are going to miss their SDG goals on several of, you know, key SDG indicators, whether it is about women's, uh, uh, women's empowerment, gender equality, whether it is about health and nutrition, or on several other, uh, uh, other uh, of those SDG indicators. And then of course the COVID happens, which has, put the entire world behind by several years, in many cases, perhaps even decades. We have just given up the progress made, uh, you know, over, over, over last so, many, so much of time. So it's really an, an important, uh, you know, time for all, all of us to put our heads together and see, okay, where do we stand and what is it that we all need to do as a community of, of people who are passionate about, you know, making a difference, about making, making uh, uh, an, an impact uh, in, in this world. As part of my uh, you know, initial uh, remarks, I would like to share a couple of anecdotes. Uh, you know, first anecdote is that about uh, slightly over three and a half years ago, I was actually transitioning into my current role as CEO of Grammy Foundation India from my earlier role uh, when I used to work in Canada at, at MasterCard Foundation. And, and I had a couple of weeks time in between uh, to do some reflection, introspection, thinking. Uh, and I actually started writing a book that book was called uh, Philanthropy in a Digital Age, a very, uh, you know, uh, cheekily kind of, you know, a chosen topic because, you know, I, I, I never, you know, went for higher studies, never pursued a PhD. So I thought, okay, I didn't do a PhD. Let me write a book called PhD, Philanthropy in Development in a, in a digital era. Uh, but then, you know, I, I, you know, started into my new job and never got the time to finish that book. But basically that, that whole book and the, the concept behind that book was that, uh, you know, philanthropy in this digital era will be very different from the way uh, we have been doing development all, all these years, you know, uh, in my 24 years in, in development. Uh, the kind of things we have done in past uh, are, may, may not be relevant anymore. Or, and we all need, you know, different kinds of, uh, you know, skill set, we different, need different kinds of approaches uh, in order to create a difference. Uh, you know, uh, in, my, in my early days, when I was starting off uh, in international development, somebody, and a, a well-wisher and, and a mentor to me, uh, told me about the importance of, you know, really working at the grassroots and having a very deep understanding of the grassroots. And he said that the number of years you spend at the grassroots understanding and working closely with people is uh, directly proportional to how far you go in, in your, uh, you know, career in international development. And actually, that was quite true. I always, uh, you know, say with a lot of pride that, you know, three uni very unique experiences that I, I have had as part of, you know, being a development worker. One, you know, I actually vaccinated a goat with my own hands. I have actually harvested paddy, you know, using a traditional sickle that uh, women in developing countries would often use to harvest paddy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have, uh, uh, I have, uh, you know, actually worked in, you know, places like watershed, you know, uh, watersheds and, you know, solid, you know, uh, water conservation kind of projects, working with communities directly, doing those, those participatory rural appraisal, those kind of things. And that has always uh, been very helpful for me uh, in order to kind of, you know, think uh, about, okay, who's the person we want to impact. But also, as, you know, I was talking about this, this uh, book that I started and, and never finished, Philanthropy in a, in a Digital Era, 
the fact is that the the pace of change has become so fast that you know uh, as i started to write that book in 2017 uh, you know already things have changed uh, things which i intended to write the chapters that i intended to write many of them are are not relevant anymore and yet today in my role at gramin foundation india uh, over last 6 months uh, when the entire world and you know non profit sector included has uh, suffered massively uh, we at gramin foundation india have been able to actually launch new projects in last 6 months we have hired uh, new people brought new new people on board in our, in our team we have expanded to new geographies we have de- designed and and launched new programs and expanded to to uh, to new geographies and what has made it possible for us to do all of those things and really these really difficult and trying times is our digital capabilities as an organization yeah, that's an area where gramin foundation has always excelled it was one of the first organizations which you know worked on an, on an open source technology uh, for microfinance institutions uh, to to run their uh, you know mi systems and and financial systems we also did uh, a program way back in you know early uh, 2010s like 2013 14 15 a program called mobile technology for health in which we you know uh, gramin foundation along with other funders and partners worked on a on an open source platform uh, on which you can run various kind of uh, messaging campaign uh, around health uh, you know to address issues around uh, health and nutrition we also have done a lot of work in in areas like uh, you know digital agriculture how you can write and timely access to information can can help you uh, you know make a difference so uh, you know these capabilities that you have as an as an as an organization and combined with your deep understanding of the problems and challenges faced by the low income people and of course combined with with your empathy and desire to do a dif- to to make a difference i think that's what has really enabled us to to remain effective in this trying times and and uh, uh, and do whatever we are we are doing today so i mean uh, i'll i'll pause here Uh, but but key takeaways: the pace of change is really fast, and all development organizations need to change the way we work. And all for the development workers, because this this uh, uh, session is tied to you know future of work. So for the development workers, it's it's absolutely critical that you know they always kind of you know uh, are making effort uh, to be on the learning curve, learn new things, new new uh, you know models, uh, you know new technologies, and see how that can be integrated in the work that that we do, and how we can leverage that. to to create larger impact at a larger scale so i'll pause here and then you know we'll uh, you know look into conversations but i really look forward to conversations with all the panelists uh, here today thank you fantastic thank you prabhat that's a, that's a great way to sort of open it and kind of set some perspective around the conversation that we're going to be having if i can invite jillian perhaps maybe to sort of you know given the, the role that you play in in uh, in impact measurement monitoring evaluation within within meetup perhaps if you could start with that and And, and take us through your perspective in terms of you know w- where do you see technology playing a role in the, the not for profit sector awesome thanks farooq good morning everyone i'm pleased to share today at our virtual kitchen table and in fact i'm wearing my apron i wanted to show it to you i just thought that would be appropriate um to have a wearable prop at a webinar so got my apron on Um yeah so I'm with Mida uh the Mennonite Economic Development Associates so we create business solutions to poverty around the world um I'm a, mostly a designing monitoring and impact measurement strategies and and supporting on the quality assurance side program evaluation I've got a dozen years of experience doing that kind of thing there's a lot of capacity building built into my role um so Mida does um a lot of things And today I'm going to share a little bit about two topics that I see really intersecting with the role of technology in the not-for-profit sector. Um Mida so we we at Mida we <clears throat> are managing we create these inclusive market systems and we also do impact investing and I'm going to focus on the former today. So first of all I see an intersection with technology as we make the business case for technology with our clients. So this is one of our objectives. We work with SMEs. We're constantly trying to help them to better understand the supply and demand um to improve their own profitability, forecasting um their incoming supply and the market demand can be full of unknowns especially during these COVID times. you know in agro business and the agro food sector where we work um a lot of that does happen informally and that can can be a lot of unknowns 
um, also early stage businesses who are just trying to demonstrate their business case. Um, they have a lot of competing questions and demands and a lot of ambiguities. So making a business case for technology can sometimes fall lower on the priority list. So that's something we're always trying to navigate with our partners is to understand how technology can help them to improve their profitability and ensure that they're contributing to a more equal world. So technology can really help us here. As we all know, information is power for the consumer, for the SME, and for the farmer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a few examples at each of these different levels today. Um, first of all, for the consumer, Mita has invested in a Jordanian-based application that gets you homemade food to your doorstep with just one click, that's their tagline. Um, so we have partnered with them to ensure that our women entrepreneurs ac across the Jordan Valley have access to this new market. So they are able to stay uh, in their home uh, and promote their own businesses with this application on their phones, which, and Jordan has a very high mobile phone rate. Um, so this is working really well for us. Um, so they cook and they're directly connected with a customer and they send them hot food or catering through a, a pre-arranged delivery service. And I have a quote here from one of Mita's clients who has seen an income increase with this technology. So this is really exciting. Um, initially, Raida's family was hesitant. She began cooking and selling through this app, which is called Bill for N. You should check them out. They've got a great website. Um, and quickly her family changed her their tune in terms of her economic activity. As a result of this technology, she said, when they saw the orders and the extra income come in, all of my labor, their whole perspective changed. She recalls her average income is now between 200 and 475 Canadian dollars each month. So that was a big change for one of our clients and as a result of, of an application from a Jordanian based company. So that was really exciting. Another example, and uh, Farouk or someone, please jump in if I'm going over time, just let me know. Um, at the SME level, technology helped us to work with a company and realize that their women poultry producers would be better served and happier buying a smaller package of poultry feed. So previously there was only available a, a 10, or a, rather a 25 kg unit. And um, based on some research that we did with some mobile data collection, we were able to make the business case with this company in Tanzania to say, hey, let's package it in 10 kg bags. And that helps women to purchase it within their, the, the money that they have. And thus we have a new product that was, is women friendly. At the farmer level, going down to the farmer level, now we can bring in another example from Tanzania. We have worked with a firm in Arusha to create a mobile management information system so that green bean producers can um, realize in, in a quicker amount of time how much their product, how much of their product made a certain standard and thus what price they're going to fetch for their green beans. So previously there's a, a lot of unknowns. You send your product to the market, you don't know where it goes, it takes some time to get paid. When you do get paid, you're expecting more money. So this helps, this SMS-based MIS system that this company has employed and created with Meta's help can help their farmers, their producers understand how much they'll be paid for the crop and, and also get their money faster. So those are a few examples on how technology can help the bottom line of a company and to create a more inclusive market, which is really exciting. So this is really, you know, what we're going for at Mita. Now, turning to what I focus on on a daily basis, um, which is mo more on the mobile data collection side. So this is where we see what technology can offer us um, on the learning and the measurement side. So within our monitoring and impact measurement systems, we definitely build in technology to the greatest extent possible. And, you know, Prahab was definitely right. Things are changing all the time. So we're always scanning and seeing and seeing what is available. Uh, these days, what's available to us usually means um, a phone survey. We can look at interactive voice response surveys known as IVR surveys. This is when your phone rings up and there's an automated voice at the end um, asking you some questions and then you punch in 
your response to those questions. We can, we've done SMS surveys. We also do mobile data collection, which is basically um, a person going out into a rural or remote location with a tablet or, or a phone and then collecting that information on the device and syncing it up later to the server. Um, yeah, so we, we employ a complement of these methodologies to, to ensure that we're learning and that we're measuring. And it really depends on the context where we employ what. Um, so we want to meet the needs of our clients. We want to keep that user experience in mind. That's something we're, we're constantly thinking about. And it, it, it's not always easy. It takes, it takes some critical thinking and challenging of our assumptions um, in terms of what our SMEs want, what our farmers want, and also basic internet connectivity. Um, I think sometimes we assume too much with internet connectivity. Um, so let me turn and just tell you a little bit about how this all pieces together and what a typical data flow looks like at Meta. So usually we'll take our phones into um, a rural location and we'll employ an app called iForm Builder to collect our survey data. Of course, there's a whole complement of, of these apps, very similar Kobo, Toolbox, ODK, etc. From there, we will clean the data on the server or we can use an API like Zapier to push that data directly to our client relationship management software or CRM, which we call it. Um, and the actual specific one is called Microsoft Dynamics. It's a Microsoft product. So we can push it through the API to CRM. And from there, we connect the wires to a great product that I really wanna to recommend to all the data geeks on the call today, which is Power BI. So this is a Microsoft um, and I see Latte's nodding, uh, so I think he's, he's heard of it. Um, this is a Microsoft product. It powers your business intelligence. So on this platform, you're able to create really awesome and interactive reports and dashboards, ones that can enhance faster learning and create a culture if you're looking at these dashboards regularly to create a culture of action-oriented intelligence. So this is really great, and this is where the value add is. And I'd really recommend leaning into Power BI these days. It's really powerful and really helpful. Something Julie, just, if, uh, yep. If, if that's okay, we're gonna, we're gonna move ahead to Latte and then we'll come sure. back and I wanna, I wanna delve into this a little bit more. Sure. But I think it's, it's really helpful to get this sort of broad perspective and to hear a little bit more about the specific technologies that you're using as well. Lati, I don't know if, if, that's a, if that's a good place for you to begin. And, you know, if, if you want to just maybe take a step back and share your perspective from, from Oxfam, obviously you've heard of Power BI, you're thinking about how technology is playing a role uh, in, in, in Oxfam's uh, um, perspective. But Oxfam has also been through some major changes over the last little while. I don't know whether you, you, want, to, you want to share some of your reflections regarding all of this. Sure. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Farouk, and greetings, uh, everyone, uh, friend that I see on the screen. And also, I see some familiar names in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you all for taking the time to join uh, today. Uh, wherever you are joining from, we are, we are really glad to be here. Uh, so, no, this is, I mean, this, this topic is uh, one of my, uh, you know, my passion, actually. Although I'm not a technology geek, but, you know, for what I do every day, uh, I'm, 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 you know, I'm really excited. Actually, just the fact that we are here today, right, together, uh, having Prabhat from India, having colleagues from Canada and around the globe, you know, is uh, because of technology. And also the fact that we continue to do our work today, at, at least in Oxfam, we continue to, you know, to, to, to do our work to fight the injustice of poverty, uh, fight gender uh, injustice, climate change, uh, really through digital. And how can we do that better? You know, without without really this kind of technology. So I'm 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 really happy to be here to share some few experiences from Oxfam and some few perspectives as well. Also, just from you know my over 20 years uh, in this uh, in this sector. Uh, just to say, uh, Oxfam, as you probably know, we are uh, a global organization uh, with the uh, the mission to fight the injustice of poverty. I'm insisting on the injustice side because. You know, obviously in development, we, 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 we know that some of the issues that many communities um, are facing are not just quick fix or, or, you know, technological fix. You know, we can leverage technology 
but there are some in-depth structural issues, governance issues, uh, power dynamic that if we don't look into that, you know, uh, technology will not help us to, to, to fix it. But obviously we have to, to leverage technology to, to achieve that. So I'm really excited that, you know, nonprofit as Oxfam and many other, we have no choice, you know, today than to adapt and fully seize the opportunities created by this third digital revolution. So, you know, uh, technology such as AI, machine learning, things like that, I think for me, it's just exciting. And I, in my previous role, even before joining Oxfam, I've been really engaged to really promote, you know, I see, I see ourselves, Farouk is here, as some kind of incubator. You know, uh, you probably hear about uh, companies, uh, Digital Green, uh, you know, Oxfam Care, we, 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 we supported the, the, the emergence of that kind of uh, platform in, in Ethiopia, for instance. Uh, you know, when I think about Hello Tractor today, uh, which is like the Uber for, 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 for farmers, where uh, farmers can use uh, technology, their phone to, to book a service and then uh, book someone to come and, and, and plot the, the field. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to say, uh, what, five, six years ago, I was part of the uh, care team to really support the incubation and, and give funding to, to, to Hello Tractor in Ghana to do a pilot, etc. Et so, so for me, technology is really key, is here to stay. And we really, as nonprofit, we have to embrace it. Uh, sadly, because of resource constraint and in some instances stuck in old ways of working, uh, many nonprofit put technology in the back burner. But I don't think this is a good strategy, and we really have to fully embrace it. Uh, and I always think, you know, we 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 are talking about future of work. If like Oxfam and many other organizations, you know, more than 50 years, 70 years, we have to start today, uh, uh, like, like a, a fresh organization. Uh, I don't think the setup we have today will be the same, right? Uh, uh, you know, and a colleague, a friend of mine, colleague of mine, who say, uh, if, if we, we, we give up everything and we want to start a new INGO, you know, uh, international nonprofit organization today, uh, we, can, we can borrow a lot from, you know, the like of uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, etc. So we, we really owe to, to transform the way we, we, we operate so that we can really catch up and, and leverage technology to, to really fight the injustice of poverty. Otherwise, I think we, I mean, the risk is we become redundant, we become irrelevant in the sector, and many new players can really take over very easily. So, so I, I really believe that technology is here and we, we ought to really uh, leverage it. Uh, but why I'm really proud of technology, I'm a big fan of technology, I'm, I'm a promoter, I think technology also has some flip side, and in Oxfam, uh, one thing that we are looking at is uh, uh, the right aspect of technology, right? So we call it uh, uh, right in a digital age, because obviously, you know, we, we are all concerned about uh, data pr privacy, uh, security, especially for community that we work with. In, in many remote areas, people who are uh, quote unquote illiterate, how do we also protect those people th their rights so that they can they can they can you know they are not abused and they can make the best out of technology so that's something that i like to really bring into these debates and also i'm really proud to say oxfam uh, in 2015 was one of the top leaders in this space to really put together a policy uh, on what we call responsible data policy and data rights so obviously uh, we, we 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 come to this space not only to leverage the technology but also to see how we can we can we, uh, we can use it in a way that is accessible is uh, is is useful and you know the half of the the, the the planet can also fully benefit from the technology and i'm also happy to share some few uh, case studies uh, in terms of you know some few things that we are doing within oxfam uh, in terms of technologies just to to give you an example we just won uh, a prize uh, which is called the, the 2020 prize for, uh, from the EU uh, for uh, using blockchain to, to really support cash transfer in the Pacific. So obviously this technology helps us to have uh, faster transaction visibility and make sure that the money that are uh, um, 
push for people are really used by by those people for you know for uh, whatever uh, use they want to do for it. So 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 blockchain is 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 is, is something that we are we are seeing as the great potential for emergency humanitarian work. Even in agriculture, we have also uh, be been uh, piloting uh, blockchain uh, in country like Cambodia, you know, for 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 a rice value chain to see how we can connect farmers in the cooperative and and also consumer in, in Europe so that we can have transparency in the whole chain, right? So so consumer in Europe who are really concerned about who produce the rice, um, uh, work ethics, safety, uh, organic things like that. So they can trace, they can, uh, they can see in real time where the, the the rice is coming from. But farmers as well are really connected, and, and you know they can get payment through the blockchain uh, uh, technology. So so just to say, we have we have some few experiences that I love to share more in this in this space, and this is just a, a, an an exciting space for us and hopefully we can we can we can debate this further uh in this um, uh, kitchen table so i'll i'll stop here because of time but happy to that i mean to dive in a bit more in the question and answer thank you fantastic thank you latte <clears throat> and you know between between the three of you you've mentioned a few sort of key technologies you've talked about blockchain um ai and machine learning have come up uh, just a very very shameless plug for the course that uh, we're working on we're going to be taking each one of these specific technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D printing, the Internet of Things, and we're going to try and demystify them on the course that begins from the 23rd of September. So if you, I know that the three spots left, <clears throat> uh, we strongly encourage you to, after this webinar, see if you can get in the application queue because uh, our objective is to ensure that we demystify each one of these technologies as we go into uh, uh, into into the the 21st century. So, Gesh, you had some questions you wanted to start off with. You need to unmute. There we are. That's a perfect start. Uh, and and uh, to to tell your position where you stand in terms of the use of technology in the in the nonprofit sector. Uh, Farooq and I have a few questions and then we will open it up uh, and, and please uh, type in your question and, uh, in the chat box and we will take those questions to the, to the panelists. So let me start uh, with you, uh, Prabhat. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, due to the pandemic, many sectors uh, saw, uh, saw job loss, including job losses in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I mean, uh, Latte is here, I mean, and we all knew about how many jobs uh, um, um, uh, that Oxfam had to uh, let go people. But you said that uh, at Grameen, you started new projects and, and you started uh, um, hiring people in, in, in this difficult time. So I just wanted to uh, find out, um, and, and you have worked in India, you have worked in Africa, uh, and, and, and you know what is happening in terms of um, uh, the role of uh, nonprofits globally. Uh, can it uh, share a little bit about uh, specifically on India, for example, uh, how NGOs have led a few innovations in financial technology, for example, uh, access to finance using technology in, in remote uh, rural areas. And how, uh, although they, they might have started uh, small, they have been able to take it to scale. Uh, so you look at the JAM uh, Trinity, for example. Um, so how uh, going forward or, or currently and going forward, the role of NGO in partnership with government and the private sector? Do you see that is declining, uh, increasing over time? And, and how, like your own role of Grameen Foundation, but in general, the nonprofit sector and, and, and their partnership with the government and private sector? Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Yogesh, for that question. Uh, you know, uh, India is really, I think, uh, a very, very, very interesting place for uh, innovations in the development sector. For the benefit of those of you who may not be familiar with the term Jam Trinity that Yogesh was using, Jam stands for Jandhan, which is a no frills bank account for the masses. Uh, a stands for Aadhaar, which is a unique identification uh, for 1.2 billion uh, Indians uh, that has been issued over the last seven, eight years. And mobile, so over a billion people in India now have a, a mobile phone. So that Trinity of you know uh, having a no frills bank account, uh, having uh, Aadhaar connectivity, unique identification, and having a mobile phone in your hand is is what makes it uh, really uh, 
possible to do a number of things which was not possible before. So, uh, you know, under the, the Jandhan, uh, for example, uh, almost, uh, you know, 35 million, sorry, uh, 350 million uh, accounts have, have been opened. Uh, and that is possible, it is possible for the banks to open so many accounts because, uh, you know, the, the cost of serving those, those accounts, maintaining those accounts has, has become so much cheaper uh, because of digital technology. Now, a, a Jandhan uh, account, for, for example, only offers you a, minimal, a, a minimalist service. It is not full financial inclusion. It is your, your starting point to be financially included. But then there are several steps be, beyond that. You know, you have to look at how people can access a wider range of financial services and non-financial services and livelihood services, access to markets, access to jobs, et cetera. That's when you know, full uh, economic inclusion would happen, not just financial inclusion. But we are far from, from that, that goal. And one of the reasons is that today, uh, you know, uh, in India, especially in the nonprofit sector, while all of these uh, you know, very, very sophisticated and, and robust technology platforms exist, I don't find many nonprofits who have the organizational capability to build their products and services on top of these platforms, which can leverage these platforms and then serve uh, the masses. Somehow there's been something in the, in the organizational DNA of the nonprofit sector that they have never thought about going for scale. Scale was always something, you know, which the governments would worry about or the private sector would worry about. Nonprofits would think about, you know, uh, you know, building beautiful models and testing it out and, and piloting it, but never, you know, having the ambition or the resources uh, or the capability to really take it to scale. So now I think we have reached a, a point where the need is big. You know, I mentioned in, in my earlier remark, you know, how there are hundreds of millions of uh, children who are malnourished. You know, there is, uh, you know, high infant mortality, maternal mortality, you know, less than 10% people have uh, health insurance and, you know, it, the list goes on. And today it's possible to solve these problems if we have organizations who can leverage, you know, these digital technologies and what exists. And of course, you know, other things like, you know, blockchain or, you know, artificial intelligence or, uh, you know, uh, distributed ledger, those, those kind of things. But, you know, organizations simply do not have, have that capability. So I think there's a need uh, to invest in, you know, building that kind of organization capability in the nonprofit. I'll give you a simple example about a small program that we launched in this COVID time which is an unconditional cash transfer for the most vulnerable segment. So uh, we realize that with so many people who have lost their jobs and, you know, self you know, their, their enterprise have been closed, people need immediate relief. So how do you determine who are the most needy people? And that need will not be determined only based upon the economic factors, but it, there has to be a combination of economic and social uh, vulnerabilities that you need to assess. So for example, is there a household with a, with a you know, uh, orphaned or vulnerable child? Is there a household which has a one member which, who is suffering from chronic disease uh, or somebody, a, a migrant worker who has, who has lost his or her job or a remittance uh, dependent household where remittance has stopped coming. So we have uh, we've quickly built an algorithm which takes into account all of these different uh, 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 factors behind vulnerability and it, you know, it calculates the vulnerability index. And then this app tells us that, okay, who are the most eligible people to receive uh, unconditional cash transfer because you know today it's, if i know who is the most eligible person most needy person i can quickly transfer funds to them using the digital platforms digital channels, channels which exist so that's how you know, this app that we built gramin uh, gramin without borders gwb app we call it is enabling that kind of access you know in real time very quick time you know uh, we collect the profile data about these kind of people and then this, this algorithm kind of throws up you know suggestions and then we make uh, digital uh, payments to, to these households. So within two days, they have money in their hands. People are amazed. You know, the recipients can't believe when the money hits their bank account in two days' time. So yeah, I mean, that, that's an example of how an organization can, can make a difference. Likewise, you know, if, if you want to uh, spread uh, messages around, say, you know, public health kind of issues or, or anything, or today, even you know, in times of COVID, schools and you know, universities are closed, but you know, education can't stop, and you have the tools to continue with, with those things. Uh, we have, uh, you know, an app called uh, Grameen Learning Platform, G Leap, which is an Android-based platform, which we use for training the frontline workers of microfinance institutions and our own uh, field force. So in this lockdown time, we have used that really effectively to kind of continue training our, our frontline workers and, and the new recruits that we have had. 
So I think, you know, once you have built those digital capabilities, organizations can be very effective in the COVID times and in post COVID times. And because uh, the future is, you know, everybody, you know, uh, you, you go to a donor, they will ask you about, you know, efficiency or cost of reaching each client or your sustainability. And unless you embrace technology, you can't do things at scale. Unless you do things at scale, you can't be uh, very, very viable and, and we, you, you won't be sustainable. So that's, I think, you know, some of the key takeaways uh, from my side. Thank you, Prabhat. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm looking at the, at the chat and I can see a lot of people who are practitioners in, in, the, in, the, in the development project. And, you know, if we were to all take a step back and look at the reality for a lot of the professionals who are working in development, sometimes you're working in a project that is funded by a particular donor, could be a bilateral donor, could be a foundation. The biggest challenge that we face today is a question of, you know, <clears throat> the, the, the nature of the data we collect. Jillian very clearly sort of outlined the pipeline through which the, the data is managed and how they're able to transfer it using these particular APIs that connect one platform to the other. And then <clears throat> it can give you decisioning uh, power like the one that you mentioned. You can feed it into an algorithm, which can then help you to make a particular decision. But the problem is when you're working on a, on a project that is funded by a very specific donor with a very specific objective, a lot of the times we get stuck in the trap of having to collect data to please the donor, to justify the grants that we received, to demonstrate you know, very narrow impact indicators. So we've gotten into the habit and development of collecting information, not necessarily because it's actionable intelligence, but we're collecting information to, to demonstrate our fiduciary responsibility to the donor and to ensure that we're creating impact. How do we get away from this? How, how do you, the three of you think about you know, data in a very narrow project sense, but also flipping our perspective and looking at it how um, a Facebook or a Google would in terms of actionable, usable information, which can then help us to do better programming. How do we make that transition? Thanks, Farouk. Maybe I'll take a first stab at that one. It's a really interesting question and one I think that we are really grappling with now too, like as an implementer, how can we push the agenda and really help donors think about systemic change and how how to appropriately you know push for sustainable systemic change because what they ask for is not indicators it's often not you know actionable information on how the system has changed or how it has scaled in fact um, I think oftentimes we fall into this default position of resorting to activity based, um, you know, like reach. Reach is great. Uh, we, we, we're always going to perhaps need reach numbers, but do we need to be leaning into it in new ways um, when perhaps the, you know, more interesting indicators where we can learn about things like adopting, adapting, expanding, responding, and how the market is shifting in a systemic way, that I think offers us something more interesting and more impactful. So I would, I would challenge that position that definitely acknowledging that the donor sometimes asks for things that aren't, are more on the fiduciary side and, and less interesting for those of us on the impact side. So I think people like organizations like Mita and perhaps others on the call, we have an opportunity to advocate for these new ways of learning of reporting and of measuring with with technology for sure but i think and that's something that we are struggling with right now amita we're trying to figure out okay how can we make a case for this systemic change and the impact that's going to be felt in in these ripple effects with our core group of of matching grantees that are benefiting directly perhaps from the project but then also who's indirectly benefiting from that market ripple effect and then you know those family members those communities the community members those knockoff effects that that are going to be happening so how can we do that you know so which indicators do we need to think about crowding in is one that we're really excited about uh, we've committed to doing three years after project wraps to going back and doing an ex post evaluation which is you know perhaps less jazzy on the technology side it's just good old um, an evaluation, but I think it, it does offer something really exciting uh, in terms of systemic change. And I, I think that's where we're trying to really lean into um, is, is how can we, how can we examine and learn from what, what is sustainable systemic change look like? And it's not always scale, it's not always reach, but 
you know, how can we make sure that years later it's it's still going to be still going to be felt. Yeah, I can. Thank I can. Latte. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, Farouk. That's uh, that's a very good question. Um, you know, obviously we 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 all have been victim of that, right? We are, we run projects and. Uh, when you have uh, restricted funds with a timeline, uh, yeah, you 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 tend to just focus on that, and we we really miss the big picture. So I think for me, in this new age of you know digitalization, big data, AI, machine learning, all this, I think we have to think differently. Uh, but I don't think one organization, you know, I don't think awesome by itself can do it, right? So. The, the way I, I will propose we think about this will be, uh, you know, a sector-wide a wide approach. And we, we, we have some examples, but, I, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, something we can really evolve. Just one quick example that I'll give you, and, and probably, probably you are very familiar with this, is the saving group uh, uh, with SIP network, right? Uh, because at some point, many organizations, Grameen, Oxfam, you know, name it, CRS, all those big I, uh, international organizations uh, are doing some sort of savings group, you know, self-help group in India, et cetera. So what, what SIP uh, tried to do was to see how we can bring all those organizations together to look at, okay, what are the, the key data points? What, you know, what are the key questions that we need to, 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 to to answer, right? Uh, what type of inquiries that we need, and why do we need that? For what purpose, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and bringing those data set together. So, I think the SIP and the savings group could be an example. I haven't seen, you know, something big out of that yet, but I, I, I feel like it, I mean this could be a good, a good place to really step back from a project-based approach. And look at the big picture and see what can we do. You know, we have we have uh, technology now. Prabhat, I remember uh, we were doing we were using one of your technology uh, taro work uh, combined with state force to look at digitalization of the savings group. So I, I think if we pull those kind of data sets together, you know, just think about India. You know, hundreds of millions of people just in India. You look at Africa, where you know, yeah, you know, over over. Uh, 100 million people in, in, in this kind of savings group. You look at Asia, uh, I mean, other countries in Asia, Asia, Latin America, and just bring those kind of data sets together. Say, look, what, what are the inquiry? And what even for us to, to take a, this kind of right based approach, even ask those people themselves, what are those big questions that you'll be interested to, to really understand? What are those insights? So I see this is where maybe technology, machine learning, AI can play a, a big role, right? To really bring those kind of uh, uh, group group together, so I don't think one organization by itself can do this. And obviously, I'm I'm, I'm wearing my hats, uh, you know, my uh, my SIP uh, network uh, board uh, board hat here to say through a network we can really do this. We can we can just forget our silos and come together on some of those big data issues. You know, we can do it for you know farmers in agriculture, foods. You know what? What are the big questions? I, th I think for me, uh, just also you know, uh, googling the you know the the literature, some of the few questions that we need to be to 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 to, to look into is, do you have an appropriate question in mind? You know, so again, what's the question that we we want? We, I mean, we try to 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 solve for. Do you have access to usable data? Right. So I, I think we have that in the sector. Right. Um, do you have access to the people to build and maintain the, you know, the model that we want? Again, here it will take partnerships. Partnership, because I don't think in nonprofit we have enough resource to, to try to do that by ourselves. You know, we have we have uh, companies now, private sector, social enterprises, that's you know, even new startups that are really building you know robust technology. So can we partner with them, universities, right? Uh, you know, you have, you have uh, IT, uh, IT students, right? They are, they, they, they are just excited. They want to, you know, get their hands dirty very quickly. So, so, so do we have this kind of partnership? Do you have those people who can come in and help us, right? Um, and then the, I mean, the fourth question is, do you have a plan for managing issues around ethics? 
biases and in, in interpretability. So those are some of the big questions as well. And again, as I said earlier, for us, some, you know, the digital right is so important because of this day and age that we are, we really have to look at uh, data privacy, protection, safety, especially for people that we work for, right? You know, communities, people who don't have the same level of education, even ourselves, we are abused today by many of this company. So, so we really have to look at that. And then the last question is, is it worth the, you know, the trouble? And I would say yes. So, so to say, just you know, to, to, to summarize, I think we can do this, but it has really to be a, a sector-wide approach. We have to come together, we have to get the partnership rights and really use those big data that we have in the sector. Thank you. Thank you, Latte. So Latte is optimistic. He believes the platforms like Seep Network um, working together, collaborating will give us a, a pathway through. And I think he makes a valid point that, you know, it doesn't have to come from within the development sector. We can sometimes collaborate with the private sector. We can collaborate with universities and academic institutions to bring in that, that skill set as we go in. But Latte, you did mention this, this issue of, of uh, data and, and, and rights, digital rights, as you call it. And, and again, I think this is such an important question that I feel we're still clumsily sort of grasping through. We don't understand enough about, including for ourselves. You know, we, we're assigning so many of our own privacy rights to a lot of the, the companies that we interface with. How do the three of you feel about this question of, of, of data privacy for the communities, the individuals that we work with? Because yes, we want to collect this information. We want to turn it into actionable intelligence. But a lot of the time we're working with people who do not understand what these, what, these, what, what these privacy questions are. And we start thinking of these people rather than being beneficiaries or clients of ours to now being producers of data. They're literally just you know, data factories that are giving us information. Of course, we're going to anonymize it, which is going to help. But how, how do the three of you feel about this? And obviously Oxfam is a little bit further ahead of the curve. You've already started thinking about the question of digital rights. And I think we can play that right in both ways. One, in terms of protecting privacy, but also second, ensuring that you actually have access. I see a lot of the things in the thread coming up saying, I work in a remote community in the, in the, in the Himalayas and we don't have access to the internet. Do you think it's like human rights, we should now have digital rights that include access to a mobile phone? If I'm, if I'm a, a, a farmer working in a, in a rural community and today I do not have access to a mobile phone, I am much, much further behind than people who do have a mobile phone. So if you can just take that and, and run with it, the question of, of digital rights, both in terms of the privacy, but also in terms of access. Um, and I don't know, Jillian, Prabhat, maybe you want to kick off and then we can come back to Latte. Sure. Yeah, that's definitely a really good question. And I'm, I'm keen to hear from Latte how, how Oxfam is handling, handling that. Uh, being ahead of the curve. And yeah, it's a tricky one. I think the way we have approached the question of privacy so far, Farouk, has, has been focused on informed consent. Um, if I segment our clients into two, we've got the SMEs, the small and medium enterprises. For them, it's a little bit easier for them to understand that idea, what that means. We can build some language into the contract, make sure they're on board pretty straightforward. For our, our farmer clients, the producers, um, other folks uh, who, who might be in low literate situations, it's definitely a lot trickier, you know. Um, so we do have um, strategies to convey a, a simple idea of what informed consent is and to seek their, their consent when we pick survey data, when we take pictures, when we interview them, when they join a focus group, etc. So we do do that. We, we have a couple ways we, we can do that depending on the context. Um, we have a form we can do on, uh, on iForm Builder on our device. Uh, we can do it in an audio way. We can also put a sign up and, and you know, on a, at a big farm event, like a big trade show, something like that. But these, you know, it is, it does take a really considered approach um, based on all of the different contexts where we and our partners might be operating. Um, something like one of the effects of this privacy thing is, you know, a client can request that we strike off their data from our records entirely. So we are working hard to ensure that we can, in fact, our data systems have that level of um, rigor that we could do that. So that's a that's a big 
big thing for us that we're considering and, and we want to make sure we have the capabilities for that. Um, but it's, it's definitely hard. If I think of a groundnut processor, processing women in northeastern Nigeria, um, you know, hopefully there's a lot of goodwill in the situation and trusted partnerships that can underpin this idea of informed consent. Um, if not, then I think the whole thing is going to fall apart and, and there's not much point. So I think uh, this is where trust and, you know, these social capital skills where we need our development workers to be able to facilitate and build trust and, and communicate with, with folks from government, uh, leaders, uh, donors, all the way to, you know, our, our our friends in the field who are our producers and processors. So it is it is something um, in terms of the access thing. Yeah, I think that's something where we need to understand the context in the early days and, and be constantly adjusting our methodologies to make sure that they're appropriate because there are real gendered effects here in terms of what the IVR example that I mentioned earlier, we we did find that our response rate from men was about, I think, five points higher than that of women. So that wasn't great. We, we were kind of expecting it. And that's indeed what we did find from the data, just because men's access to mobile phones is, is that much higher in some parts of Tanzania and probably most of Tanzania. So, yeah, it's a really tricky question. Um, Lots of lots of things to consider here, and um, yeah, context matters. But it's it's really good, I think, to have a really comprehensive strategy where your team can jump off from and use those tools at their disposal as appropriate. That's what I would say from Nita. Fantastic. Any reflections from Prabhat, and, and maybe we can then move on to something else. So, uh, Faruka, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, this is, you know, uh, you know, a really, really tricky arena. Um, uh, so on the one hand, you know, let's say we say that uh, the people own their data, right? And as as Jamie was 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 mentioning that, you know, uh, how they are trying to make sure that if people want their data to be deleted, you know, it can be deleted from their systems. On the other hand, uh, your regulators and you know, say income tax authorities may want you to preserve data for a period of say, seven years, or in some countries it may be even longer. So which means that you know uh, you, you you don't have a consistent policy between your income tax regulation versus data privacy laws, and unless you have that that clarity, of course the you know laws with regard to income tax or you know combating uh, you know uh, the anti money laundering or you know uh, combating the uh, financing of terrorism, you know, CML, uh, you know, all, all those laws will prevail over any, any, uh, uh, any desire for data privacy and, and uh, favoring, favoring the clients. So that's, that's a very practical challenge. And I think, you know, we are, we are in, in, in a new world where the rules are, are very nascent, you know, uh, you know, before the, the GDPR laws came in, for example, it was like, you know, the, the Wild West, you know, when, when that land grab started in, 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 in the U.S., you know, in, in the uh, 17th, 18th century, uh, whatever, or, or you know, maybe even before that. So data, you know, has been like that. You know, whoever gets access to data can, you know, can go and grab as much of it as and use it or misuse it the way they want it. And then, of course, you know, fortunately, the GDPR laws came. But I think countries around the world need to evolve their own, uh, you know, data privacy laws. And it's not just about formulating laws, it's also about having the capability to enforce those laws, which is severely missing, you know, across the board, like in the governments, in the non-profit non -profit, non -profit sector, as well as in the, in the private sector. So I think, you know, it's, it's not just a challenge for the not-for-profit, you know, uh, we are all, you know, uh, uh, work, working here with, with good intentions. But, you know, many times we, one might find that, as I say, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So uh, we don't really know at times, you know, how data that we are sitting on could be misused by parties that we do not, do not even know. Uh, I'll give you an example, you know, in, in Grameen Foundation, uh, we have a model called Grameen Mitra, whereby we kind of, you know, work with multiple product and service providers and bring their products and services to our, our community, to our community agent network. So, you know, it's a kind of, you know, a relationship with, with multiple parties and that client data, we don't own the customer, you know, we don't sell the product, but it, it's, it's the, you know, it's the insurance company, it's a, it's the bank which is selling the product. So who owns the data and who can do what with, with that data? 
all of those questions are, are not simple to answer. It's, it's a very complex set of relationships in which we exist. And that's the only way of serving people effectively. So, yeah. Fair enough. And I, I think I just want to highlight a point. I think one of our participants, uh, Imran uh, Kibria, is making as well regarding the question of access. You know, in, in the chat box, I can see the point that he's making regarding the fact that a lot of people do not have a smartphone. They do not have access to the internet. So the, there is a question to be asked, of course, regarding the, the, the information we can collect from the people who are participating. But what about the ones that get left behind? What about the ones who are marginalized? And I'm sure if we went out and, and did a, a study today in, uh, in, in the middle of India, in the middle of uh, countries like, like Kenya, farmers who have access to a mobile phone, I'm sure are doing better than those who do not have it, right? If you look at the amount of innovation that's taking place in the field of agricultural technology, whether it's in terms of precision farming, whether it's in terms of predictive analysis, optimizing your yield, you know, we can, between the five of us quote probably, you know, 10 or 15 apps that we've seen come up that are playing a different role in agriculture. What happens to the farmers who do not have data? What happens to the farmers who do not have a mobile phone? Lastly, I don't know, maybe I should ask you this question because I know Oxfam thinks about this from a rights perspective on both sides. And any reflections from you there, and especially because Imran asked the question, I wanted to bring it back into the conversation. Yeah, no, thanks, Farouk, and thank um, Gillian and Prabhat for your perspective. I completely agree with, uh, with both of you, actually. This is not an easy uh, question and is emerging, it, not just for nonprofits, right? Even here in the US, uh, if you, I mean, I mean, for those who follow the news here, there was, uh, even, you know, within, in the crust of the, the, uh, the, this pandemic, there was some, you know, uh, uh, big uh, question to, to big companies like uh, Google, et cetera, those digital companies, right, by the Congress here, just because, because th th those questions are real and the privacy, safety, accessibility, how those data get used. We have election coming up, and you know we are all scared that you know technology will be will be misused. So those are those are really real questions, difficult questions. Uh, but I think we really have to raise them. We really have to raise them, and uh, lawmakers will have to step up a bit more to take responsibility. And uh, as Prabhat said, to to really have the capabilities to also monitor closely. This is not easy because this I mean this uh, this all, all these things. And you, but coming back to the accessibility, uh, yeah, we obviously at Oxfam is, uh, this is something that we put in our new strategy, uh, you know, 2020, 2030. So digital right is, uh, is a big one because we just believe we can no longer, you know, ignore this issue. So we are, as, as I speak, you know, group of colleagues are working hard to really produce the first document that can help us to shape uh, our policy, our advocacy, we campaign a lot, as you know, our campaign, and also obviously our practice as well. Uh, but we believe, I think, uh, data, uh, uh, digital rights should really include the, 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 I mean, the question of uh, access, uh, you know, access. So, you know, obviously today, as you say, Farouk, in, in Kenya, if you, you know, we, we, we believe um, access to, to digital technology should, should be a right just as education uh, was or still is, right? Because, you know, obviously if you are, you are disconnected, you are, not, you, are, you are not plugged in, you are missing out a lot. So, so digital literacy and accessibility will be, will be key. And we, we as nonprofit, we need to push that. Uh, the, the, the second thing we are seeing is uh, affordability. Uh, I can just tell you, you know, I, w I was on vacation last year in, in Africa, in Togo, you know, born there. And I, even my kid, who, you know, you, I mean, you buy, you buy data to, to, I mean, for your mobile phone or for internet. It's so expensive. It's really expensive. So I think, I think the affordability issue should also be put on the table, right, for people to, you know, because many companies are making a lot of money out of this. Is it fair? You know, so so again, lawmakers should really step in to to help so these technologies is really accessible for for everyone actually. Uh, 
uh, and, okay. and you know, there's just a lot we you know we need to do. I'm happy to share some of these things offline, but yeah, just to to to, to flag those Fantastic. few things. Fantastic. Okay. And, I, and, and I just want to remind the, the participants are joining us from from across Canada that this is not a question of just India or a question of what is happening in Togo. This is a conversation that we're having right here in Canada. There are still many parts of the country where internet access is not something we can take for granted. Uh, a lot of the large mobile phone companies are given a, a, a mandate by the government as part of their, um, th their access to, to the various digital um, um, streams and, and um, bandwidth that they have that they need to improve and increase their, uh, their coverage across the country. So there are many parts of Canada still where we're still having this conversation today. I see a note from Akram regarding the question of sustainability of these, of these interventions that we do in these projects as well. And I think that's a thread we can pick up at some other time. But if it's okay with everyone, I'd like to pivot a little bit more to talk a little, a little bit about the NGO worker in the 21st century. Let's put the data conversation away. And let's talk a little bit about where we see all of this going. And as you all know, you know the, the, the skills, the capabilities of the development worker are, are, are a very important uh, component in making sure that you're able to do good work. Uh, but it's happening with, with other sectors as well. I mentioned radiologists uh, and white collar jobs like accountants are going to be replaced in the next 15 to 20 years. We're seeing realtors, a lot of the work that real estate agents are doing are being replaced by technology. As you begin to think this through, what do you think are the skills and capabilities that a 21st century development worker needs to cultivate? Apart from sort of being open to the technology, what are the other things that would make someone, if somebody was joining us as a student today, thinking about, you know, inspired by what you're doing, saying, I'd like to go into, into development work. As you look into the crystal ball, what skills, capabilities, what kind of an ecosystem do you think they're going to go out into? And, and let me just add something to that, uh, to that Farooq. We only have uh, 10 minutes left now. So if, if you think uh, your current work, um, on all, three, all three of you uh, uh, in, in your organizations, uh, fast forward five, 10 years, what aspect of the work you think will remain uh, as, as it is today? And what aspect of the work will change due to technology? So maybe if, if not, I can, I can start off. Uh, uh, so uh, poverty and uh, deprivation and vulnerabilities that we see all around, it's not going to go away anytime soon. You know, it, I'll be, you know, uh, highly optimistic, but yet, you know, I don't think that by 2030, you know, SDG goals are going to be achieved. Or even if we achieve SDG goals, you know, it's not about, you know, eliminating all the problems in, in the world. So our, the work that we are doing uh, stays relevant, but uh, how we work, of course, uh, has to change. Uh, and uh, you know, at Grameen, uh, one thing that we have uh, made an an important uh, transition, we have started making an important transition, uh, is looking at this challenge of uh, you know working in projectized mode, whereby you only engage with the community or a problem with a certain uh, defined period of time and you make huge amount of investment in developing tools, capabilities, products, and then the project ends and then you don't know what to do with those tools. It's like sunk costs. You, know, you have not been able to optimize on the investments. Uh, and you actually don't look at them as an investment. You look at them as, as, as uh, expense because the donor has given to you. So I think we as Grameen Foundation in India are transitioning from that projectized mode to an institutional mode. So we are kind of actually setting up a social business. So that whatever investments and tools we uh, the investments we make in tools and products can be leveraged over a period of time and can help us uh, go to scale. That's that's an important transformation. Secondly, of course, we will continue building on in our on our digital capabilities, uh, you know, uh, in various sectors, whether it's in the sector of agriculture, uh, or uh, you know, nutrition and, and health, or into livelihoods and financial services. All of that. Uh, the third thing I would like to mention is that as an organization kind of you know transitions or make any kind of transition, there's a huge job of you know this this change management, which is not easy. Uh, you need to kind of you know upskill, reskill the existing workforce as well as you need to instill a culture of learning, and that's actually uh, you know for the development workers in general. I think the sooner they realize the need to uh, always uh, be learning, uh, you know the, the better off they will be. You know the day you stop learning, you will be obsolete. 
So that's an investment everybody needs to make in their own careers as an individual. But we as an organization need to facilitate that process. And just one last point I'll make and then I'll pause, which is about a message to the donors that, you know, uh, when we would go to the donors, we would like to ask them that, you know, don't fund just projects or don't fund, you know, the short term projects of one year, two year, three year. They don't solve the problem. If you really want to solve the problem, invest in building credible and capable institutions that can solve problems in the long term. So I think, you know, that kind of, you know, uh, collaborative partnership with the donors to have to be on the same page as to what are the problems we're trying to solve, how we will solve them, and then to agree on a kind of relationship between the donors and, and organizations like, like us so that we can really solve that problem at scale and, and sustainably. So I'll pause you. Thank you. Fantastic. Lati, Jillian, as you think about this going into, into the future, if you were giving some advice to someone, what's, what's going to change? What's going to stay the same? Yeah, thanks, Farouk. Maybe I'll jump in, Latte. Um, I think there is something to be said for social, these social capital skills. I'm not saying we all have to be able to vaccinate 300 goats. Maybe Pravat is the only one to take that claim. But I really do agree. Earlier, you had mentioned the value of, of you know, grassroots legitimate experience. And I do think there is something to, to that. Uh, that it keeps you connected. And I don't think that's going to go away. Um, unfortunately, as, as vulnerable situations and, and vulnerable people will persist, unfortunately. I think, so as the world changes, we're going to need even more and more that social capital, the facilitation skills of our development workers to be able to speak to, to a, a wealth, a, a broad variety of folks um, to add value and to add valuable service for our clients. Um, so yeah, certainly I think being tech savvy, being open, having a growth mindset, you know, those are really gonna be appropriate. But in order for technology to be leveraged and appropriate and ensuring that we're not misconstruing data in, in funny, silly ways, you know, we're gonna need folks who are able to bridge that, that gap uh, and, and ensure that role is there to help our businesses um, you know, promote a more inclusive world. Um, I think software engineers have a bigger role than ever before. I think that's something that I've learned in the last five years. I have some colleagues in Africa, one colleague in Africa who's a software engineer, and I'm so excited to learn from him, and we need more people like him, frankly. Um, so let that be a lesson. Um, I think people or organizations like MEDA, we need to be ready to experiment. We need to be able to advocate for the donor for a broader systems level mark measurement question. And, and we need to advocate for that type of development worker who is tech savvy, who can uh, not maybe code, but can speak that developer language. And um, so my call to action is keep your aprons on. Keep your, we're gonna have to continue to experiment in the kitchen and and continue working together on partnerships like these. Thanks for it. <clears throat> Latte, what do you think? Thanks for the brilliant uh, uh, answer from Pravat and Gillian. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll categorize this in two, right? So one for international organizations, like, you know, Oxfam, uh, Media Tribe, and also people who work for a grassroots organization, right? So I think for organization, international organizations like Oxfam, yeah, I completely agree that you know the next generation of development workers will be, have to, you know, just has to be different uh, than what we used to do, right? I mean, previously is uh, brick and mortar, right? You know, and and we try to do everything by ourselves. I think this has really changed a lot and is keep changing. So I, th I think for me is really people truly understand the complexity of poverty issues, right? People is, is because some of those issues that we are trying to solve for uh, is not a generation issues, is really deep seated structural power issues. Some have power and try to exclude other from power, uh, from resource allocation, things like that. So, it, you know, the development worker really has to understand that from my perspective. So you really have to really have this kind of analytical mindset. You have to understand and then bring your, obviously the, the experience from, you know, empathy, connection is it, it just, those things are really key. 
uh, more and more we are pushing for a feminist uh, approach to development as well, right? Feminism, uh, obviously, uh, because we have been also, in the, this sector has been for for a long time, you know, um, uh, male dominated. We need people who really embrace the principle of feminism, who can work, you know, regardless of gender, who can embrace gender justice, uh we we really need that more and more we are also talking about decolonization right for so long non-profit from the north you know adopted the, the colonization mentality so they will go let's go fix let's go fix africa let's go fix asia right let's let go you know we are the savior it's, it's, it's done so we need people who really embrace the culture of participation inclusiveness you know those people in Asia, in India, in wherever they are, they, they know they know best their context. So people can come in with humility, who can facilitate development, who can you know set up dialogue, conversation, and find you know a solution, who can pilot, etc. So to me, that's what we need going forward. We need leaders in, in the nonprofit sector, in the northern organization, the international organization, who can really bring those kind of uh, um, Attributes. So obviously, technology will be key. So uh, technology, but I would say uh, research insights. So how do you how do you really use data to really get insights? You don't need to be uh, an engineer, but you have to be willing to learn. You have to be willing to partner, right? You, you have to be humble enough to say, "Look, I don't know it all, and but I'm 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 keen to 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 really." So to me, that's what what I see for the next generation. Uh, and for people who work for non-profit in, in the global south, uh, you know, uh, local organization, I think they really have to also stop thinking that the north, the north will come and save them. Really, they have to push the governments. They really have to take advocacy seriously. Uh, because many of those issues, they, 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 they leave it, they are fully aware of it. So how can they organize to really take advocacy, policy, because most of the time it's, it's not just you, you go train farmers. What, what, is, what is the policy opportunity here that the government can put in place to really you know, use the budget that they have in a way that can really support what the, 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 the issue that they, they care about? So I think, I think for me, people who are for nonprofit in, in the South really have to take this kind of advocacy, policy, mantra, and really work together and use then partners from the North as allies, you know, so together we can solve those issues. So anyway, those are some, 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 some few thoughts. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Lati. And I think that's, that, that's, a, that's a really good sort of, you know, summary from, from your perspective and a call to action as well. I, we have a very limited amount of time, but if I can do a very quick round, any concluding thoughts from you, Jillian, as you kind of as you were preparing for this conversation, as you've been you know, doing some research and thinking it through 30 seconds, 45 seconds, your sort of concluding thoughts on this one. And then we'll go on to Prabhu. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I just want to echo uh, what Latte was saying. Um, I think he put it very well. I'm glad he mentioned the feminist take on this and the decolonialist take on this. I think we have to change the way that we think and technology does offer us a new way to De sort of detrench these these traditional ways of, of thinking and, and doing business. And I think that as an implementing agency, that is our role. It is to push against the boundaries. It is to ask questions of the donor, of ourselves mostly, and, and definitely of our governments, whether that be Canada or, or in the South, and to bring humility to the table bring trusted relationships to broker these trusted relationships, whatever the topic, whether it be technology specifically or poverty alleviation in general. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'm going to leave it there. These are very complex issues and it's really good to have a, this kitchen table to, to navigate it together on. Thanks. Thank you, Julian. For about in 30 seconds or 45 seconds. Uh, thank, thanks, Farouk, and thanks, Jillian. Uh, you know, I would have also kind of you know, just echoed those words that, that uh, you know, Latte was talking about, you know, the need to bring in humility, the need for having a more equal relationship between, you know, whether it is North or South or, or, or whatever. I'll just add one more dimension to it, which is, uh, where is the moral compass, uh, you know, uh, that guides your decisions? The data is there. Data has always been there. 
but it's uh, it's where you drive what drives your your uh, where where does the, do do your ethical and moral values stand and you know your ethics stand and how do they drive your your uh, decisions so i think you know if we can go back to that that's okay you know uh, that that moral compass uh, you know and and that those ethical perspectives i think you know we, we will be better off in addition to uh, all these aspects around you know the need for uh, you know humility the need for collaboration and more equal collaborations and, and and partnerships and of course i mentioned earlier about the need for being you know always on the uh, on the learning curve so a learning individual a learning organization a learning society okay thank you thank you prabhat thank you latte thank you jillian i think it was wonderful uh, what um, and the end and what what we are saying that it the future will be different uh, uh, it will be digital but along with the digital i think we need other human skills which are very powerful as well going forward so i think i think with that um, uh, i would invite back uh, jamie uh, to conclude everything thank you so much i appreciated this conversation tremendously I, i'm wishing now that i had joined jillian and had my apron on um, <laughs> so i'll have to think about that for our future conversation so i appreciate that very much and the conversations and themes uh, that are coming through in this now our third uh, dialogue on the future of work and workers are coming back to those same pieces around social justice, equity, the importance of communities and ensuring that we are having a balance of those technologies that we're going to need as we move into the future, but also those very important human skills and the social capital that we're going to need to continue addressing the issues that um, all three panelists mentioned are, are not going away quickly. So how is it that we, we can leverage these new opportunities to do the work to grow the impact that we have? For those people who are joining us and uh, you're keenly interested in this topic and want to go deeper, we do hope that you will consider applying for our course, The Future of Work and Workers, which as we've mentioned, uh, will be facilitated by Yogesh and Farooq. Uh, thank you so much for the excellent facilitation and inquiries that you've offered the panelists today. So we do invite you to visit the website. You can see that now on the screen for more information on that opportunity. And of course, um, if this is, fall is not the time for you, then there will be other opportunities coming up over the next few years. Uh, to Jillian, Alate, and Prabhat, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Uh, I guess it's this morning here, but different times for you, depending on what time zone you're in today. And we certainly appreciate the thoughtfulness and the compassion that you bring to the work and the passion that you're showing through the conversations that we have had here. Thank you all very much uh, to Brian and Kate behind the scenes, making sure that the technologies and uh, the closed captionings and things which are now there are here. We appreciate that. And to all of you who've joined into the conversation, offering comments, questions, uh, we look forward to hearing from you again in the future. And uh, there will be three more dialogues coming up over the next couple of months in concert with the Future of Work and Workers Certificate, which again, uh, you can find more information on the website. So thank you all very much. We're grateful for having you join us and we'll look forward to continuing the conversation very soon.